Hi everyone, I'm Katie Couric and this is Yahoo News Now. More details are emerging about Ahmed Khan Rahami, the 28-year-old man suspected in the bombings in Manhattan and the Jersey Shore. He is currently in custody and law enforcement sources say he is not cooperating. We've learned he traveled to Afghanistan and Pakistan several times in recent years and that he had written about a Muslim cleric who inspired the Boston bombers. His case is also reigniting an already heated debate on the campaign trail about immigration and protecting the homeland from these kinds of threats. Senator Jean Shaheen of New Hampshire is with us from Washington, D.C. Senator, thanks so much for joining us. Nice to be with you. So we're going to be talking about two initiatives, legislative initiatives, that you are uh, sponsoring in a moment. But first, what is the latest on uh, this investigation on your end? Um, well, I would applaud the New York Police Department, the FBI, all of the Homeland Security officials, everyone who has worked on this investigation for the speed and the just the sharing of intelligence and the way they were able to track down the person responsible. Now, obviously, they're still investigating to make sure that there were that he acted alone or to determine if he acted alone, looking to see if there were any other people involved and what motivated him. But I think um, the fact that they responded so quickly and um, found the person who was responsible is a tribute to all of the work that has been done by communities across the country, by Washington, to try and make sure that we are prepared when there's a terrorist threat to the homeland. What are you hearing, Senator, about that question that you mentioned, whether this was a lone wolf or, in fact, part of a quote-unquote terror cell or even a sort of a loosely organized group of, of like-minded individuals or friends who might have been involved? Have you, are you getting any indication of how things are playing out? Well, at this point, I don't have any more information than you do or anybody who watches the news. Um, that investigation is ongoing, and I'm sure that when, when there is more information to be released, that um, the public will hear about it. As you well know, the Obama administration is trying to fight this uh, really on two fronts, online in terms of thwarting the kind of ideology that seems to right. fuel these kinds of attacks, and also on the battlefield. So how do you fight this war on these two distinct fronts and it, our military efforts actually undermining the, the efforts to kind of quell this kind of radical ideology? Well, no, I think we've made progress on both counts. And in fact, what we've seen is about 40 percent of the territory that ISIS had controlled uh, has been taken back. Um, we are, um, as most people who watch the news know, we're in the process, hopefully, of uh, going into Mosul, and um, that hasn't started yet, but the planning is underway. And so I think those efforts have um, been successful because of our ability to work with partners and um, to take the fight to ISIL. And, and as I have listened to experts, one of the things that has been appealing about um, the ISIL doctrine has been this idea that they have a caliphate, they have territory, that they're going to govern this nation state. And in fact, the fact that they've lost this amount of territory, that they have had to retrench, that they've not had any successes in months, right. is something that is deterring those people who are thinking about um, going over to fight. Now, one of the things that we've also heard is that with defeats in in the territory that they've controlled, that there has been a push to get um, independent actors to, to, that they've tried to provoke terrorist attacks in the West um, as a way to, to take the attention away from their losses in the field. And so we've seen that. Um, we don't know yet if that's what motivated um, the person in the New York and New Jersey bombings, but um, we do know that that's been one of, one of the ways of operating that we've seen from ISIL. So I guess what you're saying, in essence, Senator, is it's a bit of a double, the proverbial double-edged sword, isn't it? These military gains that are being made while you're saying they may sort of uh, make some of these individuals lose motivation or the movement sort of lose, lose steam, 
At the same time, this sort of ideological call to action in places far away from the battlefields um, may be resulting from the very inroads that we're talking about. Well, I think the other thing that's going on that's important to remember is that there is a whole effort underway um, to try and get to those people who are um, disaffected, who are um, who the ideology appeals to through social networking, right. and that um, those efforts are becoming increasingly successful. So for those people, we have people who have gone to the front lines to try and fight for ISIL, who have become disillusioned, who have come back, who have been willing to tell their stories. Those kinds of um, efforts on social media are very important as we look at how do we dissuade people, young people, who may think um, this is a cause that they want to support. And I think it's very important for them to hear what really goes on, for them to hear the horror. And um, we've got a, a very um, a good example of that right now at the UN with Amal Clooney and the young woman who was captured by ISIL, who was a Yazidi, who um, was raped, who lost um, almost all the members of her family, and they are now collecting stories to talk about what's really going on and why this is so horrible and why we need to make sure that it no longer exists. Let's talk politically about sort of the impact of, the, of this weekend and, and what's, what's happened. The, the election is right around the corner um, with the caveat that you're a Democrat, you've endorsed Hillary Clinton, you did so about a year ago. Um, are you concerned that this could be more helpful to Donald Trump? Well, only to people who are not paying much attention. You know, I, I, I think if, if you're concerned about world affairs and about how we respond to the kinds of terrorist acts that we saw in New York and New Jersey over the weekend, how we respond with our allies, to protect the United States, both at home and abroad, um, then there's no question that Hillary Clinton is the person who should be commander in chief. What we've heard from Donald Trump is his disparaging of NATO. He says that NATO's obsolete. He doesn't understand that it's been the strongest alliance um, since World War II, uh, probably in history. Um, that the only time NATO has invoked Article 5 to take action was in defense of the United States. Um, he has talked about giving nuclear weapons to countries around the world who really should not have nuclear weapons. So, um, and he doesn't seem to understand the importance of our military leaders. He's disparaged our military leaders. So I, I think for people who are concerned about the safety of America, who are concerned about world events and the impact of those world events on Americans, that there is only one choice in this election. I believe Donald Trump is unfit to be commander in chief. We need Hillary Clinton. Donald Trump Jr. weighed in on this whole sort of refugee issue. I'm not sure if you saw this or not, Senator, but I didn't. he posted um, uh, something basically comparing Syrian refugees and Skittles. Uh, he showed a picture of a bowl of Skittles with the caption If I had a bowl of Skittles and I told you just three would kill you, would you take a handful? That is our Syrian refugee problem. Meanwhile, Mars, that makes uh, the company that makes Skittles, responded by saying Skittles are candy, refugees are people, basically calling the tweet inappropriate. I'm curious to get your reaction to that. I think it's totally inappropriate and undermines the values that this country was built on. Um, we have a very robust, um, careful um, process where we review people who want to get visas, who want to come into this country. And as um, Mars pointed out, refugees are people. If we look at what has made this country strong, it has been um, refugees we, and immigrants. We are all immigrants in America, unless we're Native American. We all came here from somewhere else um, to try and find a better life. And um, you know, I was fortunate to grow up here and to have heritage that dates back to before the revolution. 
my husband's family came from Lebanon, three of his grandparents, and have contributed, have worked hard, have brought their culture and their customs and their food and their music, and it's made America um, a much more vibrant and better place. Having and said I think that's what Donald Trump and apparently his son don't understand. Having said that, Senator, you know, even James Comey, the FBI director, said, I think about a year ago, that you can't vet every refugee. And I'm curious if you think there are any, in any way, the system could be improved because people obviously are very nervous about, you know, how people are coming into this country. Do you feel completely confident that the system in place is in fact adequate? I, I think there's always room for improvement on everything, and we will continue to assess um, how the system works and try and make improvements wherever we see that we may need to do that. But to suggest that the way we're going to respond to immigration is to put up walls around this country, to deny the global world that we're living in, just totally misunderstands um, the 21st century. I think anybody who thinks that that's going to be an option for America um, doesn't recognize the world that we're living in today. Let's let's talk about those two uh, legislative initiatives that I mentioned uh, when we first began our conversation. The Afghan Special Immigrant Visa Program that you and Senator John McCain are trying to get renewed right now. This allows individuals in Afghanistan who have been employed by the United States government for at least two years and provided important information to the U.S. military on the ground in terms of material information, uh, you know, some kind of support, intelligence support, um, would be able to come here. And at now that renewal of that very program seems to be in jeopardy. Why? Um, I think it has a lot to do with the immigration debate that's been happening in this country. The fact is um, we have had thousands of Afghans and Iraqis before them who have served as interpreters, have provided critical intelligence and information in the country, who have worked side by side with our men and women in the military to contribute to the successes that we've had um, in Afghanistan. And um, because of that, so many of them and their families are threatened now by the Taliban. Um, I've had um, one um, former Army uh, Marine, uh, man who served in the Marines from the United States, from New Hampshire, talk to me about one of the interpreters that they had, a woman named Wassam, who was so helpful to them in so many ways. And because of her service in support of the United States, she was killed by the Taliban. So these are people who have um, put their own lives at risk, put their families' lives at risk to try and help Americans. And what we said to them, as we have said to all of those who serve in the military, is we will not leave you behind. Um, and many of them um, want to come to America because they're threatened. We have about 2,000 special immigrant visas left for Afghanistan. We have about 13,000 people in the pipeline. And if we do nothing, um, so many of those um, men and women who served us are in real danger. Their lives are threatened. Their families are threatened. And uh, I, it's not only uh, a problem for, for them, for the people who are still serving in Afghanistan, but it's a long-term problem for our national security. So members of, are members of Congress simply too concerned, in your view, of a backlash, given how heated this debate has become, the backlash by voters? You know, I think if, if we could bring this to a vote, it would pass. Um, what we've seen, Senator McCain and I and um, others went to the floor. We tried to get this done, and we got overwhelming support, bipartisan support from our colleagues. But there are a couple of people in very powerful positions who are able to block this from getting done, and that's been the holdup. And, you know, at one point in the discussion about trying to find a compromise, one offer that was made to us was that um, we would, we could have a special immigrant visa for every 
diversity visa in another immigrant program that we were willing, willing to reduce. So no connection whatsoever between the two programs except that they both deal with immigrants. And so I, I think that's an example of what the discussion around immigration has done to a program that has the support of our military leadership, has the support of our diplomatic leaders. Um, Ambassador Ryan Crocker, who served in Afghanistan, has talked about how important it is for us to extend this program. We've heard the same thing from uh, General Petraeus, from General McChrystal, from so many of the military who have served, who say that this has been critical, not just to the mission in Afghanistan, but to future missions. Because how can we promise people in countries where we're operating that they should work with us because we will help them if we renege on, on that help that we offered? Switching gears, you've also authored the Sexual Assault Survivors Rights Act. Uh, can you tell us briefly what that entails and why you were inspired to do so? Well, I was inspired by a young woman who um, named Amanda Nguyen, Amanda Nguyen, who was a Harvard student who was raped, um, who, after she was raped, um, felt like she was also mistreated by our criminal justice system because what she found out was that even though there was a long statute of limitations to address that crime, um, the rape kit that was so critical to making sure that somebody could be brought to justice um, was going to be destroyed after six months. And if she hadn't requested that they hold on to the rape kit, that it would be destroyed. And that, unfortunately, is what happens so often in cases of sexual assault and rape. They are the most underreported, um, under prosecuted crimes that we have in this country. And so the Sexual Assault Survivors Bill of Rights is an effort to make sure that people who are sexually assaulted have certain basic rights. It, it builds on um, the Adam Walsh Act, which provided basic rights to victims of crime. And it says that um, they should have uh, rape kits that, if they are taken, that they should be kept for the same amount of time as um, the statute of limitations. It says that they should be entitled to um, certain information about services available, that they shouldn't have to pay for analysis of rape kits, um, some really basic rights that everyone should be entitled to who is the victim of a sexual assault. And has that gotten much support on Capitol Hill? It has. It passed the Senate with a strong bipartisan vote as part of the Adam Walsh um, uh, Survivors Act, and it passed as a standalone bill in the House. It needs to come back to the Senate now, and the President has indicated that he will sign it. So I think it's a tremendous step forward, and I applaud the courage and determination of Amanda Nguyen in coming to Capitol Hill and going from office to office until she found she came to our office. Um, we said, you're absolutely right, this is wrong, we are going to help you, and it was that determination and courage that has allowed us to get this basic um, Bill of Rights done for the victims of sexual assault. And, and finally, Senator, given the polling uh, right now, it's not impossible that, that Donald Trump will be our next president. If that is the case, how will you work with a President Trump? Well, I think it's the question is, how will a President Trump work with Congress? Um, he has indicated a tremendous amount of disdain for members of Congress, even members of his own party. So hopefully we'll see a, a change of heart if he becomes president. Senator Jean Shaheen. Senator, thanks so much for your time. Enjoy Thank talking you. Nice to you. Nice to be with you. Thank you. And we always look forward to hearing what you have to say. If you can follow Yahoo News and me, Katie Couric, on Facebook and Twitter, and use the hashtag Yahoo Now to let us know about what you think about everything you just heard. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time.